Man, a few years ago, about probably about four winters ago, I was driving down 37th Street out here, and it was slick. I was in my Dodge Dakota, uh, and I got down to the first intersection. I think it was Bell. I think it was that, that there, and a guy, a young man, pulled out right in front of me. I don't think he even slowed down at the stop sign. Probably thought, you know, like, if I try to stop, I'm just going to slide out into the intersection. So I think he just went. Perfect timing for me to, to hit him broadside. i got to tell you, my brakes were not a factor in this collision. They just, they were applied, but it seemed to speed me up. And I hit him broadside. It was a collision. I was only going 30 miles an hour, if that, maybe 20. But if you hit somebody in a, in a truck uh, going 20 miles an hour, uh, let me tell you the damage that can be done. Both airbags deployed. Uh, it's about as hard as I've ever been hit in the face. Uh, it didn't hurt, but it was a sudden stop, I tell you. Both airbags deployed. Totaled my truck. I mean, just crumpled the front end in. And by the, by the U-shaped indention into the side of his car, I'm pretty sure his car was toast too. It was a sudden stop. In fact, you could just look at what uh, my car and his car and you could see what happened. I mean, the collision and the results of that collision spoke for themselves. There was no doubt uh, what had taken place and who had hit who. And, and the impact and the results were obvious. Uh, it was, um, no one was hurt, uh, I don't think. He did get out slowly, <laughs> and I did rub my head like, man, that thing hits hard. <laughs> Have you ever been hit by an airbag? They, they do come out forcefully, let me tell you, uh, but they do protect you. Have you, ever, have you ever had a collision with God? Have you personally ever collided with the God of this nation and the world? Not in a wreck sort of way, but in a, I just experienced God sort of way. I mean, there's a sudden altering of the trajectory of our life. It is a lot like a collision sometimes. When you meet with, experience, or encounter God, it can be sudden. It can, it can change the entire, entire course of your day. It can change the entire course of your week. It could actually change the entire course of your life. Trajectory is a direction, a general direction. And sometimes when we collide with God, when we encounter God, it does change the trajectory, the course, the direction of your day, of your week, of your month, of your year, of your life. It can be that dramatic. And, and i got to tell you, we want it to be that dramatic. There's something wrong when we profess to believe in the God of this universe, to know Him personally, and to encounter Him personally, and then to be unchanged. I can tell you, you could look at those two cars after that collision and know that there had been a collision. But there have been times in my life when I've looked at me, and then I've thought, I wonder if anybody looking at me would ever know that I've collided with God, that there's been an encounter, that there's been an experience, that there's an on going relationship with him here's the deal we're looking at what it means to learn to pray effectively lots and lots of people pray in fact I would venture a guess that upwards of 95 to 99 percent of you in this room pray on a regular basis even uh, maybe you don't necessarily feel like it's effective maybe you don't necessarily know what that's all about but what we're trying to do is to do more than just pray what we're trying to learn to do as a church is to pray effectively. And what we've said effective prayer is, is not learning the right words or, or the right systems or the right methodologies in terms of how you say what you say. But what we're saying effective prayer is, is if you connect with God in and through your prayer. That you experience Him and that experience with Him in and through prayer alters you. It changes you and it grows your relationship with Him. So we want to do more than just have a prayer life. We want to do more than practice a discipline. What would it be like if you practiced something and never got to actually put it into, into, on the field? If, you were, if you've ever played football or if you play a musical instrument, if all you did was practice and discipline yourself and you never got to actually experience the use of that practice, it would be, it'd be terrible. No one would practice. And I think that prayer can be like that. We pray all the time and there's never any real results so many times. And when we learn to pray effectively, though, when we learn to pray effectively, like, like the Bible says we can, and the promises of Jesus uh, admonish us to do, when we learn to pray effectively, boredom with prayer is going to be replaced with great expectation, and monotony is going to be replaced with adventure. 
And prayer is transformed from a duty to an experience with God. Let me say that again. Think about that just for a minute. Think about your prayer life being transformed from a duty to an experience with God. Who among us wouldn't want to experience God? Today we're going to look at a story where a guy named Elijah not only met the conditions that we've talked about, but had a major collision with God And the people around him had a major collision with God. It was amazing. And what we've done up to this time is we've talked about three conditions of effective prayer. Let me go over those just real quickly with you. Uh, We said that one condition for effective prayer, and that there are conditions, first of all. Not all prayer is equal. God has told us some conditions that we have to meet in order to pray effectively. The first one is we have to learn to keep God's kingdom as our top priority. We have to stop praying with our kingdom being the first priority and God's kingdom being, uh, and start learning to pray with God's kingdom being number one. And there, you can go back a few weeks and listen to that message and talk about what that means in further detail. Learning to pray in faith is the second one. We can't pray in doubt. We can't pray out of uncertainty. We can't pray out of hopeful optimism. We have to pray in faith. And faith is like a sixth sense that we adopt, and it's a choice that we make to believe and trust God and take Him at His word. Faith, remember, is always a response to God's word. It's not a response to our hopeful wishes or desires. It is always, faith is always a result or response to the word God has spoken to us or planted in our hearts. So we have to learn to pray in faith. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. And the third thing we talked about last week is we have to learn to confess any and all sin so we can stay in fellowship with God. The Bible says that when we let sin stay in our lives, that is we commit sin, we do things we know are wrong, and we don't admit it to God and quit it, that that sin becomes a barrier to the effectiveness of our prayers. That God will not move past your unconfessed sin. And that is so important for us to learn to live righteously as to not to live above sin as much as it is to live aware of sin and humility of confessing it, turning away from it. If you have to confess the same sin uh, weekly, uh, that's okay as long as you're sincere. As long as you're saying, God, I want to learn. I, I say that because I've done this. As long as you're saying, God, I hate this sin. I don't want anything to do with it. And then it keeps tripping me up. Now, hopefully, and in my life this has been true, that there's been progress and we're growing. Uh, God is patient and his grace is never ending. But to live righteously is what that third condition is about. It doesn't mean perfection. It means honesty and humility before God that is characterized by confessing our sin. Here's our story that we're going to talk about in just a minute. It's about um, Elijah a prophet of God. And we're going to talk about the key players and give you the setting. But you know what? I need to stop and pray right now and ask God to just move as I speak uh, so that it's not me giving a speech. We want God to speak to us. Father, right now we recognize that I don't have the wisdom it takes to do what needs to be done. I don't have the wisdom it takes to communicate what needs to be communicated. I certainly can't get spiritual truth into the heart of someone here listening but you can your spirits present right here God and because your spirit is present all things are possible and you can do the amazing God we're gonna ask you right now that we could have a collision with you there would be a sudden and marked experience with you that would change the trajectory of our lives and it wouldn't just leave us with information but it would result in transformation of not only what we know, but who we are. We cry out to you, the living God of this universe who has given us this incredible freedom we celebrate this week. May we be good stewards of that freedom. We are free to learn to pray effectively. And we ask you to help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Here's the story. Uh, Let me tell you the key players in the story so so you understand who's who. Uh, Ahab was king uh, of Israel. He was not a good king, okay? Ahab was a bad, bad king. He was not a nice guy. Obadiah was the king's right-hand man, for, for no better way to say that. Uh, he served in Ahab's court in charge of his palace. He was a devout believer in the Lord God, though, okay? Obadiah, good guy. Ahab, not a good guy. And then we have Elijah. And Elijah was a prophet of the Lord God. He was a wanted man in that day. Ahab hated Elijah. 
Ahab wanted to kill Elijah because Elijah was a prophet. You know what prophets were known for in that day? Not so much as foretelling the future, but forthtelling the present. They spoke truth about what was really going on. Sometimes those people aren't very prof- are popular, right? When someone's really honest, uh, especially when we want to maintain dishonesty, that doesn't go so well. Ahab and Elijah had that conflict. Baal, I, li- I hate to list Baal as a, as a character or a player in this because there's no such thing as Baal. It's the name of a false god. Okay, Baal was the false god that Israel began to worship because Ahab and his wife Jezebel led that nation into that kind of idolatry. Okay? So those are the key players. Now here's the story. Israel's under the leadership of King Ahab. They have gone astray. They've started worshiping Baal. And they are under a drought. God has stricken, stricken the nation with a three-year drought. They're near the end of that drought. But it's still very, very uh, desperate times. Cattle and livestock are dying. So Ahab gets Obadiah and he says, we need to go in search of greener pastures, so to, not so to speak, but literally, to keep what livestock we have alive. So they split up. The king and his right-hand man are out in search of green pastures, places that they could actually sustain their cattle herds and their livestock herds. And they are out looking, and Obadiah runs into Elijah. Obadiah is... Uh, let's say sympathetic to Elijah, but he's not real excited about meeting him because he is afraid now that Elijah, that he's going to have to basically keep a secret from the king because he doesn't want the king to kill Elijah. And so he is terrified when Elijah says, Obadiah, I need you to go tell Ahab you've seen me. And Obadiah says, "Uh uh-uh, are you crazy? That's not exactly what he said, but that was the message he was trying to communicate. And he said, do you not know that if I go tell the king I've seen you and he comes to look for you and you're not here, guess who the king's going to kill? Me. He's going to kill me. I'm not saying a word. And he said, listen, Obadiah, calm down. That's not part part of the story. But I do think he was trying to say, chill out. Just calm down a little bit. I've got a plan. I need you to go get Ahab. And I want you to bring Ahab to me. I'll be here. Okay? And I don't think, if you read the tone of the story, that Ahab or Obadiah was real excited about it. Okay, the risk. He was. He was risking his life to go tell the king that he had seen Elijah. Because if the king comes to look for Elijah and Elijah isn't there, Ahab was notorious for killing the person. To basically saying, why didn't you catch him when you had him? Why didn't you do something about it when you had him? Okay, so they go in search. They find, here's the story so far. They go in search of green pastures. Obadiah didn't find green pastures. He finds Elijah. Elijah says, Obadiah, go tell the king you found me. And he's like, okay, I'm going to go tell him. And Ahab comes. Here's what Ahab says when he meets Elijah. Is this you, you troubler of Israel? That's what he says when he sees Elijah. What's Elijah's perspective on this, right? He's like, huh? You're calling me the troubler of Israel? You're the one that's led the whole nation into idolatry by worshiping Baal and, and, and false gods. You're calling me the troubler of Israel. In fact, he responds somewhat similar to that. He says, uh, he says, basically, it's not me who has troubled Israel. I'm sorry, I didn't even tell you where the story was. I just realized that. This is 1 Kings 18. It's on your bulletin in case you didn't get one. 1 Kings 18. Okay? But we're just telling the story, so don't try to read along because I'm not following it. I mean, I'm telling you the story as it is in 1 Kings 18. Just realize that. Everybody's looking at me like, Where are you sure this is in the Bible? I never read this story. <laughs> That's how people in Texas would say it, not here. You sure this is in the Bible? <laughs> All right, come back to me. Immediately, immediately when they meet each other, there's that exchange. No, you're the troubler, not me. Elijah's right, Ahab's wrong, and Elijah's going to show that. He says, here's what we're going to do. I love Elijah because he just doesn't, he's not afraid. He's not fearful. He wasn't running in fear of the king because he was afraid of dying. He needed to stay alive so that he could call truth forth. So he says to the king, listen, I want you to go get 450 of your prophets of Baal. I want you to bring them back here. I want you to get two oxen and you bring them back here. And we're going to have a meeting of sorts. And here's what's going to happen. You go get those guys. We're going to... We're going to build two altars, basically, and and you're going to cut up one of those oxen. You're going to lay it on on some wood, and then you're going to pray to Baal. And you're going to see if Baal answers. And I'm going to, after that, pray to God, 
And we'll see if he answers. Whoever answers by fire, Elijah said, whoever prays and God burns up that sacrifice, they're the God. Now, one thing you have to give it to Ahab is at least he believed. I mean, he did believe that Baal was real, so he's just like, okay, we're on. 400 prophets, 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, another idol or false god, and they all assemble there. I love prior to that, during that challenge, Elijah says this, because they didn't deny, they weren't denying that the Lord God was the Lord, that he was a God, he was just, but they were saying he was just a God among many. So when you put God of the universe in that, in that spectrum, he's not there. He doesn't go there, okay? He doesn't take the leftovers. So he's basically uh, absent from their midst. He's not been active, but neither has Baal. We'll see that. He says, Elijah says to Ahab, How long are you going to hesitate between two opinions? If, if the Lord is God, then follow him. Then Baal, follow him, but not both. So let's do this challenge. So the prophets of Baal cut up the ox, laid it on the wood, began calling on Baal to, to send down fire. And they're chanting and they're, and they're praying and they're calling out. And they call out from morning until noon. Morning till noon they pray. Nothing happens. So Elijah uh, is he's kind of a funny character. Because the Bible says literally that he began to mock them about noon. Because he's not worried, right? Elijah's not like, I hope this thing doesn't start on fire. He's like, I don't know how, I don't know how long he thought he was going to let them, but about noon, he's like, hey, <laughs> this is hilarious to me. Hey, uh, maybe your God is asleep. He could be on a journey. Y'all better try something else because this isn't working. You know what's crazy is that they listen to the guy and they pray more frantically. They start cutting themselves thinking that that's going to actually get Baal's attention. And, the, and some hours later they are a bloody, worn out, frayed up mess. And the ox is of course just laying there. I just can't imagine. I really try to enter the story and I can't imagine Elijah just standing there watching them going, y'all are crazy. I mean this is crazy. Have at it. And they did. Guess what? Not a single evidence that Baal even existed. Nothing. The Bible says it like this. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. I'm going to let you in on a secret. Do you know why? Because there's no Baal. It's not a false god in that he's an entity called God. He's just not there. The, the, the reality of Baal only exists in a name. He's not there. There's not a God out there somewhere named Baal that has less power than our God. He just doesn't exist. They're worshiping a non-entity. And so he can't answer because he's not there. But they think he is. Then Elijah said, all right, enough is enough. Everybody gather around. Get the ox, put it on the wood. Took 12 stones. And it represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And they built an altar as God would have inscribed him or uh, admonished him to build the altar. Then he dug a trench around the altar big enough to hold water, about three gallons of water, and he, he brought, told them to pour water all over the sacrifice, filled up the trench with water, and when the time came for the evening sacrifice, when the time came for the evening sacrifice, Elijah, seemingly very calm, says with great resolution and faith, this prayer, I'm going to read it to you. He said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known to you let, let, it, let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your word. It's a key one right there, okay? When you hear this story, Elijah says, I've done all of this in response to your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are our God, and that you have turned their hearts back again. Now, I want to point out two things before we go on to the results. Uh, faith, we said you have to pray in faith, right? If that's one of the conditions. And faith comes as a response to God's word. Elijah did not think of this test and say, God, I need you to join me on this test because I'm going to prove them wrong. He, Elijah did the, 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 the test, if you will, the sacrifice challenge 
As a result, God spoke to him and showed him what to do. And then he said, also, let it be known that you are God. He wasn't trying to impress them with himself. He was saying, let them know that you are God and that Israel would turn back. That's keeping God's kingdom at first priority. He wasn't trying to gloat, and he wasn't trying to say, look what a great prophet I am, and to make them look stupid. He was trying to make God famous in his day, and that was the priority. Okay, And Elijah walked with God. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Guess what happened? The Bible tells us that fire fell from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, and licked up all the water in the trench. That's a true story. That is not a myth. That is not a legend. That's not an analogy. That's not a metaphor. That literally happened. Elijah prayed. Fire fell from heaven. Everything was gone. And here are the prophets of Baal sitting over a bloody, exhausted, but convicted mess. My favorite part of the story, you know what my favorite part of the story is? Is that they didn't say, huh, do it again. They said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Elijah, your God is God. We know that now. You got to give it to them at least, right? They were open to the truth, and the truth was clear, and they responded, and it was unmistakable. There was a collision of God and mankind, and God showed himself to be God. It is amazing that these people who were entrenched in idolatry were at least willing open to see the truth. Elijah met all three requirements that we've been speaking of, and God responded in power. Now, I want to go over those real quick again. God's kingdom was Elijah's greatest priority as he prayed and did everything he did. He did it for the glory and the fame of God. He did not do this to make himself look good. He did it in faith. Elijah does not seem to show any indication that he was at all wondering if God was going to burn up that sacrifice. You know why? Because he knew, because God said, this is what I'm going to do. When God says, this is what I'm going to do, you can pray in faith and know that God says, this is what I'm going to do. And the last thing is is the righteousness or confession of sin. Elijah was known to be a man who walked with God. He was not perfect, but he was pure and holy and set apart. If he sinned, he confessed and offered sacrifice for it. He he stated that in his prayer. He said, let it be known that I am your servant. Now, let's take a quick assessment of our connection with God through prayer and see if it's on the same map as Elijah's. And you're all going, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh, it's not. Right, But let's do that for, for the sake of clarity, all right? Let's put us next to Elijah. Let's put our prayer lives and our connection with God next to his. Just do it with me, okay? Don't sit there and go, no, 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 no. Let's not do that. Let's just do this. Before we all start qualifying this story, before we all start saying, well, I'll, I can't really compare myself to Elijah. He was Elijah after all. Let me, let me share something with you from James chapter 5. It says, remember what we, we looked at this verse. It says, the, prayer of effective, the, prayer of a, the effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much in James 5, 16. And then it says, right after that, it says, it answers, our, it answers our doubt. And it says, Elijah, the same Elijah we're talking about, was a man with a nature like ours. He was just like us. He was a human being. He didn't have an inside track. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. That's that's the bigger story of the story we just read. As a result, soon Elijah would pray for rain, and the drought would end. So you know what he said? Is don't think that you can't hold Elijah up as a model of how to relate to God in prayer. Because he was a man with a nature just like ours. And look what happened when he prayed. That's what James was saying. Look what happened when Elijah prayed. So I'm telling you that we can use Elijah as a standard. I'm telling you that we can use Elijah as a model, as a hero, as someone to exemplify what it means to pray effectively. I'm telling you that he is not a mythical figure. I'm telling you that he was a man with a nature like you. Did you get that? James is telling us to do the same thing I've been asking us to do, that God's Word is admonishing us to do. My question to you this morning is brutally hard. Do we even want God to answer our prayers? with unmistakable clarity and power. Do we honestly want God to do that? Now, I know that seems like 10 steps backward after we've taken 
you know, five steps forward to even ask that question? Do we, but think about this, do we really want God to show up with absolute clarity and unmistakable power? Do you know why I ask that question? I ask that question because if God does this, if we learn to pray effectively individually and corporately, and God shows up like he showed up in Elijah's life in that day, and he shows himself with whatever means to be unmistakably real and powerful, guess what? We're left with no excuse to not give our lives in radical surrender to him. And I'm wondering if we like our excuse. I'm wondering if we're pretty comfortable saying, I don't have to really give it all to God because he ain't giving much to me. He's not answering my prayers. He's out there somewhere, but I'm just going to muddle through life. And things are comfortable. It's easy. I like things the way they are. If God shows up, it's going to shake everything to the core in your life. I'm not telling you that if you start praying and God starts answering, life is going to be even fuzzier and warmer. It could be radically different for you. It could be frightening. But you will have no more excuse. So the question that I'll have no more excuse, the question we have to ask is, do we really want God to answer like this? Are we glad that we have our unanswered prayers as a passive excuse for not being sold out to following Jesus? See, if he does, we have to do what Baal, the prophets of Baal did. We have to forsake our false gods because they will be exposed as false gods. You say, we're not worshiping false gods. We're no idolaters. Well, I know that we don't call them gods, and I don't know, I don't know that we, we build altars and sacrifice to them, but I'm wondering how much of a false god money is to us. I'm wondering how much of a false god popularity is to us. I, I'm wondering how much of a false god comfort is to us. I want to be comfortable. I'm wondering how much of a false god materialism is to us. Satan's a smart adversary. I don't want to glorify him at all. But he knows that in our day we would not worship in the church a false god called a false god. But he knows that anything we do worship is effectively a false god and I'm wondering if we have bought his lie hook line and sinker this isn't a false god but look let me ask you another really hard question and we're gonna wrap this up you say money's not a false god popularity is not a false god uh, pride is not a false god materialism is not a, it's not a false god let me ask you do you sacrifice more for your paycheck than you do for the glory of God in your life? Do you do more, sacrifice more time, more energy, maybe more prayer on things that revolve around possessions and material things and a paycheck than you do for the glory and fame of Jesus Christ in our day? I dare you to answer that honestly. Because if the answer is yes, guess what we have? We have a false God. And guess why God's not answering our prayers? Because he ain't going to play that game. Guess why we like it that way? Because we think we have our cake and eat it too. We can go to heaven when we die and live like we want until then, which is a lie. Do you really want God to answer unmistakably? Listen, I wasn't I wasn't leading to this end. When I began to put together the conclusions to this message, that was an abrupt interruption into my thought process. But I feel, I feel certain that God wants us to answer that question. I'm not going to answer it for us. I, want, I feel certain God wants us to ask that question, I'm not going to answer it for us, all right? Now, here's our life challenge. Here's what we've got to do. Okay, this... Life challenge is not what you have to do. It is an example of what you can do, maybe what we should do. If you're in a life group, I want you to take this challenge. And I want you to discuss it and work it out with your group. Have, you, have, have your group start holding each other accountable for learning how to pray effectively. See, this is the life challenge. Is to take this, these three things and bring it to your group 
where you have accountability and where you have community and where you can say, listen, I want to learn to pray effectively. I want to pray with God's kingdom first and foremost in my life. I want to learn to pray in faith, and I want to learn to live righteously by confessing my sin. Maybe your group needs to, to just, just bring that out on the table and share it. Maybe your group needs to start praying about these things together. Maybe you possibly need to study or look into passages together of how Paul and others prayed kingdom prayers. And if you aren't in a life group, you should be. And I would say that unapologetically. I wink at you when I say it. But if you aren't in a life group, you should be. Now, I want you to, if you're not, okay, what you could do is go find a life group. But if you're not going to do that, what I want to ask you to do is to find a partner. Find somebody who will be accountable with you to this process. And I want you to share that journey of learning to pray with God's kingdom first, learning to pray in faith, and learning to live a righteous lifestyle by confessing our sins. Start sharing with that person. Let them hold you accountable. Let them ask you hard questions. Let them invade your space. Get rid of this rugged individualistic notion of what it means to be American and start being a Jesus follower and open up your heart to somebody else and say, listen, I want to experience God. And I want to learn to pray effectively. Seek accountability in your groups and partnerships. Confess your sin. Have somebody else pray with you about sin struggles. James says, confess your sin to one another that you may be healed. That's spiritual healing, primarily spiritual healing. God can heal physically, but the even greater healing comes to us when he heals us spiritually. Confess your sin. Talk about it with somebody else if you are stuck and struggling. Listen, the last thing we need to do, church, the last thing we need to do is have a series on prayer where we are made aware of how to pray effectively. Go, yay, that's good. What's next? And just kind of let it go to the side. What we've got to do, what we have to do, what we're compelled to do, what we're, what we're responsible to do is to say, listen, if this is what the Bible says about how to pray effectively, then by gosh, I'm going to learn how to pray effectively. I'm going to do whatever it takes to do that. Okay, so I want you to engage what we've offered you. We've offered you Bible study on it on Sunday mornings right after this. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to do Bible study on it as a group. You get to ask questions. You get to struggle with each other. And you get to learn and a greater understanding of what it means to pray effectively. And then we're offering you life groups. A, a group of 10 to 12 to maybe 14, if it get, keeps growing like ours does, of people who are just saying, we want to live this out. We understand what the truth is. And now we want to help each other on that journey. I, I'm tired of preaching sermons and, and series where we just move on. And I hope God doesn't let us move on. And when I go back and I start, because I thought this would be the end, but if, if Monday morning I get up and I go to God and say, what, you want, what do you want me to preach on? And he says, prayer. Then guess what next Sunday's going to be about? It's going to be about prayer. Because I don't want him to let us move on. Let's not do it. Would you pray with me right now? God, you are God. God, you are God. God, you're God. You're not a God. You're not hopeful optimism. You're not a theory. You're not a religion. You're not a dream or a vain wish. You are a literal reality. And we confess that we have loved our unanswered prayers. Maybe unconsciously, but we have loved the excuse that they've provided us. And we turn away from that putrid, ugly, sickening way of thinking and acting. And we turn back to you. And we ask you to invade our day with unmistakable clarity and authority so that we would be left like the prophets of Baal without excuse, declaring the Lord, He is God. We pray in the matchless, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. The last thing we want to admonish you to do is to give your life to Jesus. 
not join a church, not become religious, not be a spiritually minded person, but to turn from your old way of life to start following Jesus. And that is a literal transformation and a choice that you make. It's not a sinner's prayer. It is a life-altering decision. And so we're inviting people to become a part of that because the mission of our church is to make disciples, not to grow a church, not to build an institution, not to have comfortable, cozy programs for spiritual country club members. We are here to make disciples, a disciple church. A disciple is a person who is in a growing relationship, a growing relationship with Jesus. That's what we're here to do. That's who we're here to make. That's what it's about. And if you have never made a decision to turn your life and start following Jesus, you can do that today. You cry out to him and just simply say, Jesus, I want you to invade my life like you invaded that day in Elijah's day. I want you to rescue me from my sin because you died for my sin on that cross and God raised you back from the dead. And I believe that with all of my heart. If you've got questions about that, you can certainly mark that on your worship tear-off. If you've already invited Christ into your life, but you've never made a public declaration of it, this is a great time to do that. If you're sitting here today and you know you need to seal the deal on prayer, use this time to respond to God, okay? Let's stand and pray and respond.